Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and this is my second video blog. The topic we'll cover today is how to diagnose the bundle branch blocks in five seconds or less, because that's all it takes. For your convenience, I've made a website that lists key links to my ECG blog, my video blogs, and my introductory and advanced books and EPUBs on ECG interpretation. Above all is my email address. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. Let's start with a few preliminaries. When we say bundle branch block, we are referring to the conduction disturbances associated with QRS widening and a supraventricular rhythm. By definition, this is not VT, ventricular tachycardia. It is also not WPW, in which conduction down an accessory pathway is the reason for delta waves and the QRS widening that we see. Instead, the conduction disturbance of bundle branch block refers to a supraventricular rhythm, be the sinus rhythm or other supraventricular rhythm, such as atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or a junctional rhythm. Compare this to what happens with normal conduction, as in the sinus rhythm shown on the left. Transmission to the ventricles is fast and no more than 0.10 second because conduction is normal. In contrast with bundle branch block, as shown on the right, the impulse slows down dramatically after encountering that part of the conduction system that is blocked as conduction must now occur through non-specialized ventricular fibers. As a result, conduction to the ventricles is delayed and the QRS complex is wide. How then do we define wide? Life is simpler if you accept anything over 0.10 second in an adult as being wide. Assuming the standard recording speed of 25 millimeters per second, we know that a large box on ECG grid paper takes 0.20 second to record. Therefore, half of a large box takes 0.10 second to record, which for practical purposes means that the QRS is wide if it is longer than half a large box. This is an example of normal sinus rhythm. Note that the QRS is wide as it takes up more than half a large box. Therefore, a conduction defect or bundle branch block is present. Let's now look at how to proceed to determine which conduction defect we are dealing with. When I first introduced today's topic, I boasted how diagnosis of the type of bundle branch block could be made in less than five seconds. I have two reasons for saying this, which I illustrate on this key algorithm. First, with regard to ventricular conduction defects, there are only three entities that we need to consider. These are one, typical right bundle branch block, two, typical left bundle branch block, or three, neither, which means there is IVCD, which stands for intraventricular conduction defect. That's it. I'll again emphasize that this algorithm assumes the rhythm is supraventricular and it assumes that QRS widening is not the result of VT or WPW. The other reason we can make the diagnosis so quickly is that we only need to look at three leads. For full information, I always look at all 12 leads, but for practical purposes to diagnose the type of bundle branch block, all you need to look at is right-sided lead V1 and left-sided leads 1 and V6. That's it. While admittedly simplified, this algorithm is as accurate as it gets for rapid diagnosis of the type of bundle branch block. So what do we see with typical right bundle branch block? First, the QRS must be wide enough at least 0.11 second in duration. 
The most characteristic finding is an RSR prime with taller right rabbit ear in lead V1. As a memory aid, think of the Rs for right bundle branch block. That is, we see an RSR prime with taller right rabbit ear in a right-sided lead, which is lead V1. In left-sided leads 1 and V6, we should see a wide terminal S-wave. The S-wave is wide because conduction through the blocked right ventricle is slow. Right bundle branch block is a terminal delay with the last part of ventricular activity moving away from the left ventricle to produce this negative deflection S-wave in left-sided leads 1 and V6. What about typical left bundle branch block? The QRS should be at least 0.12 second for the block to be complete in the thicker left bundle. In lead V1, we may or may not see a thin initial R wave as shown within the red circle. Regardless of whether there is or is not a thin initial positive deflection, the QRS is predominantly negative in right-sided leads with left bundle branch block. In left-sided leads 1 and V6, there should never normally be a septal Q wave in a lateral lead when there is typical left bundle branch block. This is one of the very few times in medicine and in life when we say never, pearl. If ever you see this, an initial Q wave in a lateral lead in a patient with left bundle branch block, then that patient has at some time in the past had an infarction. Otherwise, in left-sided leads 1 and V6, you see a monophasic or all upright R wave, which may or may not have a notch. And that's it for typical left bundle branch block. Finally, if the QRS is wide, at least 0.11 second, but neither typical right bundle branch block nor typical left bundle branch block morphology is present in all three of the key leads, then you have IVCD. Intraventricular conduction defect is a nonspecific form of QRS widening. It may be the end stage of a number of processes. The patient may have begun with a typical left or right bundle branch block, on top of which scarring developed from infarction or cardiomyopathy. We often can't be sure of the cause of IVCD from the tracing alone, but by adding this third category of conduction defect, we greatly simplify ECG diagnosis in a way that is as accurate as classification by complex criteria. For example, the schematic ECG shown here looks like complete right bundle branch block in lead V1, which shows a typical RSR prime. Lead 1 is consistent with this diagnosis because it shows a wide terminal S wave, but there is no S wave at all in lead V6, which if anything looks more like left bundle branch block. So, neither typical left nor right bundle branch block, which means that we have IVCD. You are almost done. There are just two more points that we need to address, and then we'll be ready to try out our system with some clinical examples. First, what happens to the ST-T wave with typical bundle branch block? Fortunately, there is an easy way to remember the expected changes when the only thing going on is the conduction defect. In the three key leads, that is leads 1, V1, V6, the ST-T wave should move opposite to the direction of the last QRS deflection. A picture is worth a thousand words. So with typical right bundle branch block, the last QRS deflection in lead V1 is the upright R prime, yellow. So we expect ST-T wave depression in lead V1, red. In leads 1 and V6, the last QRS deflection is the Y terminal S wave, yellow. So we expect an upright T wave if the only thing going on is right bundle branch block. This relationship may change if there is ischemia or infarction. On the other hand, with typical left bundle branch block, the last QRS deflection in lead V1 is down, yellow. So the T wave should normally be upright, red. 
and in leads 1 and V6, there is a monophasic upright R wave, yellow, so we expect the ST T wave to be negative. Note, this general rule does not necessarily hold true for IVCD, in which case it may be more difficult to predict the meaning of ST T wave changes. The last point we need to convey relates to right bundle branch block equivalence. Up until now, we have only looked at right bundle branch block patterns in which there was a neat RSR prime with taller right rabbit ear in lead V1. It turns out that you do not always have to have this characteristic pattern. Instead, you may have what we call a right bundle branch block equivalent pattern, which could be any of the complexes that we see in lead V1 of the schematic tracing below. Normally, the QRS is predominantly negative in lead V1 because the depolarization vector is traveling away from this right-sided lead on its way to the left ventricle. If ever you see any of these upright patterns in V1 with a supraventricular rhythm and a wide QRS, you may still have complete right bundle branch block if there is also a wide terminal S wave in left sided leads 1 and V6. It's time to apply these concepts. We'll start with a few schematic tracings, each of which show a superventricular rhythm with QRS widening. Why is the QRS wide? Remember, there are only three choices. After you have determined the type of conduction defect, look to see if ST-T waves are doing what you expect. Note that we only show you three leads on these schematic tracings because that's all you need to diagnose the type of conduction defect. So in lead V1, there is an RSR prime complex with a taller right rabbit ear, which is typical for right bundle branch block. In left sided leads 1 and V6, there is a wide terminal S wave, so this patient has right bundle branch block. Note that it took no longer than a few seconds for us to arrive at this diagnosis. What about ST-T waves? Note that they are opposite to the last QRS deflection in lead V1, as well as in leads 1 and V6. So these are appropriate secondary ST-T wave changes that we expect to see with typical right bundle branch block. Finally, what if lead V1 looked like this? We no longer have the typical RSR prime with taller right rabbit ear in lead V1. Instead, we have one of those upright and wide right bundle equivalents that qualifies as right bundle branch block because we do have wide terminal S waves in leads 1 and V6. Note in V1 that the ST-T wave is as it should be, namely opposite to the last QRS deflection. How about this one? We have sinus rhythm with a wide QRS. Why is the QRS wide? We'll again look at the three key leads. There is an all negative QRS in lead V1 and a monophasic upright R wave in leads 1 and V6. Therefore, the patient has left bundle branch block. But what about ST-T wave changes? In which of the three leads is the ST-T wave not doing what it's supposed to be doing? The answer is lead V6. The T wave in V6 is upright, whereas it should be negative or opposite to the last QRS deflection. We call this a primary ST-T wave change. This may indicate ischemia or infarction. The sign is not perfect, but it at least provides a clue that something in addition to the left bundle branch block may be going on. Look now at this tracing. There is again a sinus rhythm with a wide QRS. Lead V1 shows an RSR prime with taller right rabbit ear. This is consistent with right bundle branch block. Lead V6 is also consistent with right bundle branch block as we see a wide terminal S wave. However, lead 1 is not consistent with right bundle. If anything, lead 1 looks like a left bundle. Therefore, since we don't have typical changes of right or left bundle branch block in all three key leads, this is IVCD. 
What could be simpler? Please note that ST-T wave changes with IVCD do not necessarily follow the opposite to last deflection rule, so clinical correlation is needed. Finally, this last one. Look at the three key leads. This is left bundle branch block, but what's wrong? There are several things wrong. We should not have a Q wave in a lateral lead like lead V6 with typical left bundle branch block. Therefore, this patient has had an infarction at some point in the past. In addition, there are primary ST-T wave changes in two of the three key leads. The T wave should not be upright in lead one, and it should not be negative in lead V1. This suggests recent or even acute ischemia or infarction. Clinical correlation is needed. Let's finish with the real tracing. Although we do not have a long lead to rhythm strip, we can see that this rhythm is irregularly irregular without P waves. Therefore, the rhythm is atrial fibrillation, here with a controlled ventricular response. The QRS is wide. This means that we need to stop with our systematic approach and figure out why the QRS is wide before we proceed. Since we are not dealing with VT or WPW, this leaves us with three possible answers right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block, or IVCD. To determine which conduction defect is present, we focus on the three key leads. Lead V1 shows a QR pattern consistent with right bundle branch block. The Y-terminal S wave in lead V6 is also consistent with right bundle, but the monophasic upright R wave in lead 1 is not consistent with right bundle, and if anything looks like a left bundle. Therefore, this is IVCD. It's more difficult to assess ST-T waves with IVCD, but that said, it doesn't look like there are acute changes here. So the conduction defect is IVCD. That's it for today. I hope this video has made you feel more comfortable assessing the bundle branch blocks. This is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now.